You know, there are certain things that, that, that Jesus, that were said at the empty tomb that I just kind of wanted to play around, jump around with, and think about out loud. Um, you know, Christianity hangs on the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then there is no Christianity. And, and I think that's what separates people from the, the intellectual understanding of the Christian ethic and people who are Christians that, believe, that experience the living Lord, okay? Um, it, and, and the resurrection, it can't be true for me and not for you. It's a dividing line. He rose from the dead, and if you choose not to accept it, that doesn't have any impact on the fact that God did send his son and did die for your sins and did make available for you heaven. So it's a big deal, okay? I thought it was ironic that the religious leaders who killed Jesus said, listen, he said he's going to rise in three days, so, you know, put a guard there. Uh, they believed in the resurrection more than the disciples who said it was nonsense, an idle tale. And um, I, I think that the, every, every Easter I go through, you know, the different reasons why the resurrection is provable, and one was, that was thrown at me this year was the, the linen cloth. The fact that it was there, undisturbed, indicates that, first of all, Jesus didn't unwrap like a mummy. Okay, He just moved on the other side of the wrap, but he did fold up the headpiece, which was a custom at the time to say, I'll be back. When you leave the table, you would fold your napkin a certain way. And so that's what he did. But, but, but really, the, the, the spirit-filled fellowship of Christians, a carried-away church, the lives that have gone on to change the world, I mean, I think that that is the f truth of the resurrection. Um, I read a book once that Christians, the early church was the civilizing factor of the world. Um, women's right and children's care and medicine and, you know, all, I mean, it was like 12 different angles of how civilization changed because Christians applied Christ's thought and Christ's life to the world, Okay. And, and you have to admit, it's an unusual event. When people have a little challenge with it, you've you got to give them that. It is unusual, right? Um, but I think a lot of people, they, it's fun. They'll, they'll set out to disprove this Christian thing, and they're real researchers, and they'll do their research and then give their lives to Jesus. In almost every century, there's people that try to do that and then go, oh, wow, this must have really happened. But the problem is they're doing their research. And that's different than stepping in to the relationship. And that's what I'm always on to you about. I want you to step into that relationship. Launch that dialogue. You know, this morning in my video, I, I said, um, you can do your homework to try to get rid of your doubts, but that's not the same as stepping in prayer and going, Lord, I got some doubts. And taking an hour to sit there and, and release it to him. Taking some time to, to hand over your doubts. Um, doing the research and stepping into his presence. Well, that's, that's just wonderful Christianity, okay? But we have lazy Christians. They don't do their homework and they don't bother praying. And they hope to go to heaven and they will go to heaven. But they miss out on the living Lord. And they, they, they don't handle their doubts correctly by, by getting rid of them. And, and <clears throat> you know, people are all about science. And, and I, I subtly mentioned it on, on Easter Sunday that, 
You know, science doesn't deal with the, the, the reality of the soul and the spiritual realm. And there is a spiritual realm. And, you know, I mean, I'm a guy that, I'll tell you what's kind of interesting. I've found that there's three. There's the good spiritual realm, the biblical one. There's the evil spiritual realm with the demons. Then there's this other category. And I just have, I call it other where people have experiences in the spiritual realm that don't connect to the biblical Christian viewpoint, that aren't evil, and there's lots of people who have spiritual experiences. And you know, I want to classify them this way or that way, but I've noticed that too many people that don't believe, that don't have a Christianity, have these experiences. And so I don't think it's such a stretch, even for non-Christians, to admit that there is a spiritual realm. And then when you put Christian spirituality into play, I got a guy in my life right now, he's, um, the, the family is estranged, and they don't accept Christianity, and there is no forgiveness, and there will be no reconciliation, and that will be the end of their relationship. And it's a, you know, father-child kind of relationship. It should be healed. It can be healed. But it requires taking Jesus' forgiveness and putting it into motion. It requires understanding people's full pause through, yeah, that sin, and sin is covered by the Lord, and He transforms you so that you come out differently, and now you can forgive, and now you can go forward. But when you don't believe end of the relationship. The suicide rate, which is so huge in every demographic, because they have no hope. Now, Jesus comes along and says, oh yeah, I told you this world's going to be a mess. Cling to me and I'll get you through it. And in fact, I'm going to make your life an exciting adventure of faith. Okay? So, there's hope. Well, um, <clears throat> I know this. People get all excited about, you know, science. And, and I've noticed, and I'm no scientist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express, okay? Um, I, I, I do my research to be just enough to be dangerous. And like, I'll, I'll, the, the contradiction between general relativity, how large cosmological objects behave, and quantum mechanics, how small subatomic particles behave, operate on a completely different set of rules as if they don't even belong to the same universe. Okay? So, you, you know, you're speaking all definitively this way, that way, and the other way, but the, the very important understanding of science doesn't even mesh. And so, all I know is that God has reached out with His Son, and He's released His Spirit, and He's given to us His primary attribute, love. And agape love is different than any other kind of love. Agape love is self-sacrificing. I care about your life so much that I'm willing to rearrange mine to make sure that, that you get touched by God, that you get lifted up out of evil, that you have abundant eternal life in a tangible way. Now that's a different kind of love. And for you to do that requires the Spirit of God moving through you. And when you do that, there is no other kind of love on earth like that. Okay? And, and I, I get a little frustrated. I'm, I'm making a big deal about this because I, I remember when, um, <clears throat> you know, I listened to these people on Facebook, you know, the political conversations. I don't know why I listen to them because they get me so angry. Okay? But, you know, you know um, <clears throat> the elite in our country will say this about Christians. Uh, you know, their, their, their children, they... They should have their children taken away from them, and they should be sterilized, genocized, and have the children re-educated. You know, uh, you know, the, you know the, the, the Christianity that civilized the world, 
that's the one that we need to get rid of. So, just when you think that secular atheism is, is neutral, it's not. It's not neutral. So, why do these people make such a big, horrible statement like that? It's because they don't see the difference that Christianity is supposed to make. And here's where it gets personal for you and me. I was somewhere the other day, and a person that used to go to our church had a meltdown in that person's, in somebody's store. And I feel bad. I mean, I think we've all had meltdowns, right? And don't you feel horrible about it afterwards, you know? And so you get to a spot where you don't melt down anymore, you know? You keep it private. You melt down in here, but you don't let it out there. When they were letting it out. And don't you know, I, I observed it, and then I waited till, you know, it was all over with, and I said hello to the shopkeeper who said, isn't that one of your Christians? And you're like, oh, yeah, it is. And the worst part is it could have been me a few years ago. And it's because we don't let Jesus lead us in those awkward moments, in those difficult times and those offensive interactions and those I'm not getting my way I it, it, so we don't let Jesus take the lead in our life and our personality and so the world sees no difference between Christians and non-Christians you know Disney used to have a, a Christian night where they'd have concerts and everything and they canceled it and, and something that I always I just couldn't believe it and I still don't believe it to this day is they would say the 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 staff at Disney would say the worst night of the year is on Christian night and I guess Christians just felt entitled and acted disrespectfully and didn't show love and that's why people don't endorse Christianity because I don't think they've really seen it, okay? And handing over the reins of your life, well, that means letting the Holy Spirit guide you. And it, this doesn't mean that you have to be perfect, okay? But it does mean that God's opinion matters when you're making decisions. And if you let God's opinion take the lead in your life, what you're going to find is you'll have fewer meltdowns and you'll see people through His eyes. Okay, and that's when I think Christianity really starts to take place. Well, <clears throat> I'm always amazed at like the Christians in Syria who are in a Islamic world, and you know they will they will preach to the people torturing them to death. You know, and. They will let their lives be used as a testimony for Christ all the way to death. And, and I have a bad feeling that if, if Christians in America were persecuted, would, we wouldn't do so well as a group. I'm, and I'm not worried about the group. I'm worried about me. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that I do it right if it ever happens to me, you know? But I, I think there comes a moment when you and I have to make a decision. Before I'm a Christian, excuse me, before I'm an American, I'm a Christian. Before I'm a secure, safe, materialist, capitalist, I need to make sure that I'm a Christian. And that's why the tithe is important. Because when you give 10% of your income, you're making a statement that the kingdom of God is more important than my my comfort and safety and security. And God just seems to honor that. Now, I'm not trying to turn this into a stewardship message or anything. But there's a few places where it's difficult to be a Christian. The tithe is one. Forgiving others is another. Okay? That's another big one. Well, let's go to another statement. Um, <clears throat> Mary is with... Mary Magdalene is interacting with the angel who says, why do you seek the living among the dead? <laughs> okay. So here's the angel. He's, he's messing with her, right? What, what, what are you seeking the living among the dead? This little humor going on here. He's not here. He's risen. And, and, and there's an Old Testament 
statement in, in Isaiah 55, why do you spend your money on that which does not satisfy? We, we so often go in the wrong direction. We're looking for life in dead-end places like, you know, a nightclub or um, affluence or prestige or, you know, comfort and security. These, these, those are actually places of bondage, not life. Life is found in spiritual relationships. And then you can go to the club and run into somebody who's got a drinking problem or is trying to find love in all the wrong places and give them hope. Then you can you know, deal with folks who are trying to get security and say, you know what, you need to make a trip to Africa and, and go on a, a missionary trip so that you'll understand that there, there's... You're holding on to the wrong things. You need to, we need to put Christianity into motion in our lives, which means a lot of times letting go of things that truly ensnare us. Okay? And have you noticed how transient happiness is? <laughs> Boy, as soon as you arrive, it makes a left hand turn. And you can have a, a bundle of cash and a nice house and a good job and a relationship goes left. And all that happiness, is, all that stuff doesn't mean anything because life is relationships. And Jesus gives us the insight on how to do relationships. Okay? Well... When you get to the end of your life, you know the question that they're going to ask you is, did your life help anybody else? And, and it's kind of a personal question because if you were to look over your life right now, um, is there an angle where others are visible in your checkbook, in your prayer life, in your conversations, in the way you orchestrate your, your day, in the way you put a ministry t t into motion. Because it's so easy to live for me, myself, and I. It's, it's a shame how easy. It's a shame, as Christians, how we can live for me, myself, and I. So the real question is, are you and I living with eternity in mind? Because suddenly, if I care about my eternity and your eternity, I'm not going to care so much about the offenses. I'm not going to care so much about things that are not as important. Okay? Well, <clears throat> speaking of eternity, there's some major emphasis on trying to find eternal life in this world. I could tell you all kinds of different organizations and different, you know, DNA programs and stuff. And, and you know what I figured out? That God has built eternity into our, our mindset. That's Ecclesiastes. That's Solomon. Okay? God has put eternity into our hearts. But he's put his eternity... You know, we want to live forever in this world, and that means you'll live forever in a world tainted by sin. That's why God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden, so that they wouldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then eat of the tree of forever and forever be castigated into living in sin. Well, I love Mary Magdalene. You know, she gets all upset. They've taken my Lord away from me, and I don't know where he is. And I don't know if you've ever had your Lord taken away from you. <clears throat> it's happened to me a couple of times. One time in college, um, I, I had this course, um, European Intellectual Thought, and it felt like the whole purpose of the course was to destroy Christianity. And, you know, week after week after month after the whole semester, they just kept chipping away at Christianity. And finally, one day, I felt some argument got me. And I walked out of the class stunned. 
You know, unfortunately, the Lord had me meet a professor who gave his life to Jesus, and I told him what I was going through, and he laughed, and he immediately dismissed that situation, and my faith, and I remembered one miraculous moment, and built my entire faith back off of that one miraculous moment, and the professor who thought the philosophy class was a bunch of idiots, okay? So, that was a moment, though. And sometimes it could be a person who betrays you. It could be a, a uh, argument that you just, if you're not feeding your faith, if you're not in conversation with the Lord, a lot of times people will try to destroy my faith, and I'm like, well, you're, you make a good argument, but I, I just can't, you know, deny what I've experienced. I can't ignore what I already know. I can't, you know. I don't have an argument for you, but you can't take away what God has given to me. But Mary Magdalene, you know, she thinks that they've taken Jesus away. And when life circumstances tumble in on us, maybe Mary thought, oh boy, Jesus is gone and the seven demons are going to come back. Or maybe she was just in love with the Lord. You know? And I'll just ask you a personal question. Are you in love with the Lord? Don't nod your heads. It's, it's a penetrating question. Because I like his blessings, and I need his guidance, and I want to go to heaven, and um, it's better than the alternative. Remember, Florida, which, by the way, it's going to be 87 today. Um, here's the thing. Are you in love with Jesus? Because if you are, um, I love Mary. She says, just tell me where you put him and I'll take him. <laughs> She'll, you can just see her thinking she's going to drag dead Jesus with her. Because he means that much to her. It's just such a beautiful description of absolute devotion. Except that he's not dead. <laughs> and he's going to be dragging her with him. You know, there's a fun story about Mary Magdalene. She makes her way to Rome, and, and you know, that's one of the followers of Jesus who rose from the dead, and she has an audience with Caesar, and, and, and you know, she pitches out her resurrection story, and, and he says, it's no possibility that somebody raised from the dead than that orange turning red, and the orange turned red. Okay. Oh, it's folklore. Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. Because in the Bible it says that you will speak to kings. And here's her speaking to the king of the earth. And the Lord wanted to make a statement to her. You know the worst part is you and I could see the orange turn red and then a week later, have a doubt about your Christianity. It's the most baffling part of being a... That's why His mercies are new every morning. Because you stay connected. And if you stay connected, then He's always filling you up with His Spirit, His Word, His hope, His promises, His guidance. Okay? That's why you got to stay connected. Well... <clears throat> um, I guess what I'm saying is an hour or two a week is not going to be enough to combat the constant onslaught of Satan always trying to chip away at your faith and at your soul. And, and you know, Mark Twain, I, I think this is kind of powerful. He had a girlfriend of his lifelong companion. And one day she was going through a crisis. And I don't know if you know this, but he was an atheist. Okay. And he was very smart. So if you've ever hung out with smart atheists, that's a challenge. I've, I've had some good, smart atheist friends. Okay? And, uh, you know, she would not be in his league intellectually. And so he says, well, why don't you lean on your faith? And then she says, because you've taken it from me. And then I need you to hear this. If the only news you watch is the secular atheists, 
because they support your political perspective, then what's going to happen to your Christianity? They're going to take it away from you. If you are somebody who, who hangs out with a bunch of people that don't believe in God, let's say all my gym buddies don't believe in God, or the folks that I play cards with and have a bourbon on Wednesday night don't believe in God, or, you know, we all have people that are in our lives that don't believe in God. If they have too much of a voice into your soul, they're going to disrupt it. Okay? So you have to be aware of this. Once again, sometimes homework is involved. Sometimes I have set myself apart from people I really liked because they just weren't good for my faith. And it's hard to say no to a friend that you've carried a long time. And, and I, I want to remind you of one more thing. You know, Christians forfeit the resurrection power because they don't stay connected to Jesus. Remember, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. One more thing about Mary Magdalene. She lingered in the garden. She lingered. You know, I got this thing where I'll come in here at five-something in the morning, and sometimes I come in here and I got the list. Okay, Lord, I need this, and I need that, and you got to do this, and I need you to step in here, and blah, 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 blah. And other times I come wandering in with nothing. Just come in to see what's going on with them. And there'll be a moment when I'll feel like, oh, I'm just wasting time. I should go up to my office and get something done. But I'll say, no, you know. And I'll linger in here, and all of a sudden I'll get a, a special touch or he'll put somebody on my heart. Or I'll have a, an answer to a big question weeks ago will all of a sudden come to me. It, just lingering in his presence seems to launch the resurrected Lord in your life. And again, if you're like me, I measure time in minutes. How many minutes did I spend with this person? How many minutes do I have till I get to my next appointment? How, you know, I'm, I try to make a lot of things happen. I got a lecture from my wife today. How many meetings did you say you have? It's the second day after Easter. I'm like, I know. You know? So I lost a bunch of minutes getting a lecture when I needed to get things done. Okay? That's a little bit of a joke, but my point is, lingering is where you get relationship lingering with one another okay is where i think the magic of a relationship happens and she lingered and she got to see the living lord well you know, it's funny about Mark's account of the Easter story. It ends, <clears throat> they left and they were afraid. It's not a very good ending. But it's kind of how it works. You mean Jesus could be alive? Have you ever been in the, the actual presence of an apex um, animal. What do they call it? The A. Um, there's, there's groups of animals, and the killers are A. They're called, they're, they're an A animal. Like a tiger, or a gorilla, or a hippo, or a 12, a 15 foot crocodile. You know, when you're in the presence of something like that, there's just a fear that comes over you because you realize that if that animal looks at you and decides to bite, you do not have a chance. And so um, I'm, I'm just trying to understand fear because people have a lot of problems with, you know, I don't understand fearing God. I, don't, I thought I didn't have to fear God anymore. Well, it's not fear, it's reverence. It is reverence. And I'm just going to tell you, that the few times that I've had an actual experience of God coming into my room and coming into my presence, I was terrified. 
And it wasn't because, oh, the President of the United States has entered into my presence. No. It was just fear. And I was embarrassed. One time I asked him to leave. <laughs> then I was embarrassed. I had an opportunity to hang out with God, and I got so scared I asked him to leave. Other times you just realize, I mean, he's infinite God. And if he's alive, that means what he says you have to listen to. And if he's alive, that means his calling is something that you have to carry out. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But here's, here's what you got to know. What's fearful is um, he really loves you. And, and, and you have to take him seriously. And, and, and so, I don't know. I think, remember when Peter met Jesus and he said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He recognized who Jesus was and who he was. Okay. And you're that and I'm this. And, and this is what I'm talking about. And Jesus sits down and says, you know what? Um, you're not this. You're this to me. You, I'm, you, I love you this much. I'm about to give my life for you because you're not some insignificant, sinful thing. I'm going to remove all the sin from your life so that you and me, the creator of your world and universe, can have a relationship. Now, just saying that, doesn't that cause a little bit of excitement, but also a little bit of, ooh, really? I think so. Okay? You don't have to shy away from God. And, and I found this really fascinating. I'm sorry I'm jumping all over the place. Hopefully you can put up with my ADDDDDD today. I put a sermon together that I didn't use, and what it was is Peter would have an experience, and then when you look at Peter's writings, there would be a comment that he would make that was exact, like he denied the Lord, right? Then what does he say in, in 1 Peter 3.15? Always be ready to give an account of your faith. He wasn't ready when he went into the courtyard, but what does he write to us? Always be ready. Okay, And then, there's another time where, you know, he says, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to destroy. What did Jesus tell him? Uh, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. So he got sifted. That was a bad experience for him. So he wants us to know, hey, that devil out there, he's, 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 he's a roaring lion. But actually, do you know that the Bible says the king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion? And what Satan wants to do is get you scared of God. Get you to disqualify yourself to step into the presence of God. Get you to see yourself this small when Jesus sees you this big. His whole goal is to get you afraid of the wrath of God which Jesus took away from you. So do you see how he messes with us? Okay. God's not angry with you, even when you blow it. The only thing he wants is to guide you away from a life dominated and destroyed by sin. You know, this one soldier was on the battlefield and the chaplain knelt next to him. The soldier wasn't going to make it. And the chaplain says, can I do anything for you? And the young man said, there's nothing you can do for me now. What I need is for someone who can undo some things for me. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He undoes the things we did because of what he accomplished for us on the cross. You know, too many people believe that God is a concept. It always surprises me. You know, I live with just, just this close personal friendship, and, and then I'll run into somebody and go, well, you know, I think that God, 
in the cosmic scheme of things. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know? And I feel so sad that for them, God is this distant concept when really God is saying, hey, come here, let's have a conversation. I'm Abba, Daddy. I'm safe. You belong to me, and I've given myself to you. It's no concept. And people, you know, I'll explain that to them. They're like, oh, no, 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 that's, uh, you know, I, I. it's too vulnerable for them. But there's the invitation to step in to the Christian message that you matter and your life has meaning. Okay? And I mentioned the political folks earlier. Um, get me all scared and nervous. I, I, I want to say this. The same power that enabled Jesus to rise from the dead is going to be the power that will dictate your future, not the person you vote for. All right? So I think if we keep our eyes on Jesus, that's going to determine the outcome of our life. The resurrection, it means you matter to God. And, um, you know, I'll never forget. <laughs> um, I, get, I graduated. I can't remember which. You, I think it was my Masters of Divinity. You know, you, you walk down, you get the diploma, you're all full of yourself, you know. I pull out my diploma. Said to my buddy, let's see yours. And, and he, he's got an empty envelope. I'm like, what happened? He says, well, I haven't finished all my coursework yet, so they let me go through the, ex the graduation exercise, but I, I still have some things I have to finish. And I'm, I'm thinking, isn't that the difference between people who've left some unfinished business with Jesus and they associate with him, and they know a lot about him, but they haven't just taken the step and said, you know what, I'm in. And I want to make sure that there's nobody on the fringe. Step in, and that's when you'll experience it. Give your life to him, and that's when you'll know. Amen.